So I'm not necessarily nervous, although initially when Pastor Al was talking about Revelations and then there was going to be this, this week when he was away with the students at camp, uh, and he's like, hey, I, I, I want you to fill in. I'm like, oh, I usually leave Revelation alone, uh, as many of us do, right? Um, but he's been breaking it down in such a wonderful way. And uh, realistically, if you're following along, we, last week we wrapped up uh, the church at Philadelphia, the, the sixth church. And so many of you are coming this morning saying, well, obviously it's the seventh church. We're going to do Laodicea, and we're not. We're going to put a pause on that, and we're going to let Pastor Al wrap up Laodicea. But I want to go back and revisit the church at Philadelphia. And the reason is, is because they, they were the church, the only church that was only commended and not rebuked. And I think there's a great deal of, of wealth of information here um, as to why and what it looks like for us to be a church that is also commended and not rebuked. Because I don't know about you, but I, when I stand before the Father, I want to be commended the way the church was commended here in Revelation. I want, in Philadelphia, I want to be like that church, not many of the others. And in fact, uh, when we get to next week and Laodicea, that's the church I really don't want to look like. So let's spend some time focusing on the church that we do want to look like in Philadelphia. If, if you recall, they were commended for a few things. First and foremost, for not denying the name of Jesus. Uh, for holding fast to who he was. They, they f- held fast in obedience and faithfulness and in, in endurance. Those were the commendations of this church. They also, if you remember, they were a key city on the edge of the Greek empire that was kind of the, the, the mission point into the rest of Asia. They were a mission city. Uh, the, the intent was that from there, all of the world as they knew it would, would know about the Greek culture and the, the Greek background and and they would be, in essence, sharing the good news of what they held in store for the Greeks. That was the key about Philadelphia. But there was also something about Philadelphia. Do we remember what the name meant? Brotherly love, right? One king built it for his brother. I think that's kind of a clue into some of what Jesus was commending the church here in Philadelphia for. We'll get to that in a few minutes. But if you will, go ahead and put up last week's personal application for me. Uh, This one's been kind of hanging on for me all week. Are we looking for open doors to share the gospel? Are we looking to be a mission city? Would we be commended for missional hearts just like they were? I got to be honest, like there's times when I say yes and times when I'm like, "Mm, maybe not so much. And part of it, I think, is because this idea of what it looks like to share the gospel might have gotten a little overcomplicated. It might be a little... Uh, sometimes a little too bulky for us. And so I want to go back and really examine what it is that God intends for us when he says, share the gospel, share the good news, be my mission missionaries, be carrying forth the good news of what Jesus has done. Because I think, I think it's not as complicated as we sometimes make it. In fact, I know it's not. And I, you know why I know that? Because Jesus made it pretty clear. But let's look, let's start first in Revelation 3 8 and, and remind ourselves what Jesus said. He says, I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and not denied my name. This is part of the commendation of Jesus. Anybody else growing up scared of the dark? Or is that just me? Okay, good. I'm not alone. I used to uh, get so uh, stressed and worried about uh, the things I couldn't figure out what that noise was or what was going on or even sometimes the, the absence, the complete quiet. I didn't know why it was so quiet. And I would often leap out of my bed and run down the hall. My parents got to an understanding they needed to leave that door open at their bedroom door and I would just bolt through their door until one day the door was closed, boom, right on the ground. Right? Uh, the, the good news here is that Jesus is the one that has opened the door. The, the door is open wide for us to share the good news of Jesus. And, and he's called us through that door. And, and sometimes we get a little stressed about walking through the door. Walking through the opportunity. See, that's what the whole picture of an open door is, is an opportunity for something on the other side. And, and you and I have the opportunity we're called into sharing the good news. 
as the church. Uh, Pastor Al laid out a great analogy, uh, some background on this word church that John uses here. The word ecclesia, we, I've used it. I've used it for years. And, and to be honest with you, he enlightened me on what some of that original context of that word was last year. I was unaware of the meaning and the background of the, the word ecclesia. And so let me remind you that there was this group of men and women called out of a community that were then by the community given the authority and responsibility to direct and to, uh, to, to govern and to share and shape the culture and the community, the city, uh, the direction of where they were going. Really, they were there to cast the vision and direction of the hearts of the people. That's the original term, and that, that had no religious connotations to it, but then it's, that term then is redeemed by God, and he says, you are the called out ones. I've given you the responsibility and authority. We as Christ followers are now given the responsibility and authority to shape the culture, to shape the hearts of people. You and I have that responsibility given to us. By who? By Jesus. By the one that, that bled and died for us and now gives us, like uh, Matthew chapter 28 says, I now give you the authority, go. Go into all the world. This is the open door that's waiting for us. But we have to really understand what's the gospel? What is it that we're supposed to do when we walk through that open door? Well, like I said, I think the clue is in the name, the, the city of brotherly love. This is what they were commended for. It's, it's who they were. Uh, let's take a look over at John chapter 13. This is actually uh, a section of scripture that, that is in the, the, the Last Supper time frame. Jesus is speaking and teaching, sharing a meal with his, fam with his uh, followers, and he says, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another just as as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. <laughs> See, the reality is, is the gospel message starts with loving one another. This was not a foreign concept to the Jews. They were, they were known for hospitality to a stranger. They were known that if so, another Jew came from another area, they often would open their door. And, and let them in and have them stay the night, share a meal, all those kinds of things. Hospitality and kindness was part of their culture. But Jesus takes it to another level. He says, I command you to have love. Not just hospitality and kindness, but love. And what kind of love? Love like I'm going to love. Sacrificial love. Sacrificial love is at the heart of the gospel message. And it starts by us loving one another. Now, that sounds simple, and yet it's a challenge, isn't it? It's difficult, and we're not putting it, we're not making light of it. It is a difficult message. In fact, it's a difficult commandment that Jesus gives us. This wasn't the first time that Jesus had mentioned this. You see, if you look back in Matthew chapter 5, um, at the Sermon on the Mount, he actually brings this about then. He says, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. You, you see, it starts with in the house. Uh, you and I are called to, to be the light of the world. We now are because of who God is. We are the light of the world. As, as followers of Jesus Christ, now we carry forth the light that that is Jesus, into the world, but first and foremost, it starts in the house. I've often jumped over that little portion of it to the next verse, and, and, and I needed to remind myself that it's in the house that our gospel message starts, right? It, it's right here in our families, in, in this community of faith. Why? Because we have to exhibit what it is that God's called us to, sacrificial love. In John, he commands it. It's not an option. It's, it's powerful, and it is palpable, and it is the gospel message. The, this is the reality is the gospel is not as difficult as many of us want to make it. The, it. We are called to love one another, but we have to first and foremost practice what we're about to preach. 
right? This is where we actually build the spiritual muscle of loving others. Because John, or, uh, we go on to uh, in a little bit to understand that we're going to take this out into the world, but first and foremost, it starts right here with you and I. My dad always told me, don't preach what you're not practicing, son, right? It, it, you just come off as a hypocrite at that point. And so we as a family have to love one another. It's commanded. It, it, it is the gospel message. Around here, that takes the shape of one of our core values, share a burden to meet a need. It, it, we've been practicing this regularly, and, and primarily this takes place in our life groups, where you get to know people, and you're known, and, and you know others. You're involved in each other's life. You know what's going on. You, you, you check in on each other. You, you get together and share meals together. You, you're involved in life with one another. But we also know that not everybody is able to plug into a group, and not everybody has that community yet. And so we at New Life want to take it to another level. We want everybody at New Life to know that we care. Whether you're in a life group or not, we want you to know that we care. And so as a church, we have care ministry. Care, care at New Life is a real thing, and, and we're very passionate about it. It's, it's shown up in a number of ways up to this point. Our prayer ministry, uh, as Mike mentioned, we are a praying church. We want to come alongside you and, and share with you in the burden that God has on your heart. Uh, we want to walk with you and, and, and talk with you and go to God with you on those things. And so prayer ministry, we've got opportunity for you to, to connect with us in prayer, uh, either after service or during the week. We recently started recovery ministry because we know that everybody is in recovery from some form of sin and brokenness. Uh, and, and so recovery ministry on Monday nights has started taking place again. We've got a few new things, and, and one of them is we know a lot of you are caretakers, primary caregivers of other people, whether it be a loved one, uh, elderly loved one, or a younger loved one, or somebody that's dependent on you, and, and you get a little overwhelmed, and that's understandable. And so here at New Life, we want to, you to know that we care by coming alongside you and relieving some of that burden. So one of the ministries that we're getting ready to kick off and are inviting you to be a participant in is this idea of respite care, giving somebody just a, a few hours to either take a nap or, or take a shower or go, get, uh, go do some errands that they need to do and just be able to relax for a little bit. And so if you have a need in that area or if you have some gift in that area to help relieve those stress for some people, we want to know about that. It's our respite care at New Life. And then we know that many of you have during that season, also lost loved ones. Uh, grief is a very real uh, and very uh, palpable thing. And so at New Life, we, we believe that we're to grieve with one another. And so uh, on Friday the 17th, we're going to have Surviving the Holidays. <laughs> Surviving the Holidays is just a, a one-night seminar to help kind of know that you're not alone in this season where that's supposed to be joyous, but in the, in the midst of a loss often becomes less joyful. And so we want to walk with you through that. So if you need to be with people who understand surviving the holidays on the 17th of this month, we would love to connect with you. And that's going to jumpstart into our Grief Share program probably starting in February. We want to walk beside people who have experienced loss. We also have this other thing that we're kicking off. In the gathering, you'll see many have referred to it as R2-D2 out there called our burden box. Uh, it's physical out there. It's also digital online where we want to know what's going on in your life, what need you have, what burden you're carrying. Why? Because we care. We also want that to be a place where you can say, hey, here's my gifts. Here's my talents. Here's my availability. I would love to help in this way. Uh, whatever the way it is that God has gifted you, made you passionate about, you can do that there. You can also do it online. We've got a couple of QR codes here, uh, and we're in the process of building this out on our apps and our website, all of our communication points. But what we want to do is we want to make every avenue possible to know how to express brotherly love to one another, to, to know what the needs are, and to know how we can meet them. And so all of us have a need. Many of us are looking at the 
the needs coming up in the holiday season and going, I'm, I'm not sure how this is going to work. And we want to know about that. If you have a need, we want to know. Why? Because we care. Because it is the gospel message. It is what brotherly love looks like. It is who we're supposed to be as the, as the called out ones, as the ones that are now light bearers to this community. It starts right here at home. You and I, the gospel message is loving one another like Christ, sacrificially. And yeah, it's hard. I, many of you I know are sitting there going, Chad, I have a hard enough time loving the people in my family. <laughs> and then you ask me to love you guys as well. Oh, well, that's quite a step. And then I know that you're about to tell me that I'm supposed to then go love others, perfect strangers. And I, and I, and I know it's tough. I know it's tough. Why? Because I know life comes at us, and it comes at us fast. You may have experienced health issues, unexpected health issues, sick kids this week, sick animals, a nail in a tire, a broken dryer twice, or maybe even wrecking a car of a friend that you were trying to help. Oh, not your week? Oh, I'm sorry, that was mine. Yeah, life comes at us quick. And guess what? I would probably have not gotten through the last few weeks had it not been for other family. To, to pray with me, to walk with me, to engage with life as it comes fast, because it does. And I know it comes fast at you too. And that's why we have to be here for one another in all the different ways. And you might think this is too trivial to share. It's not. Share it. We want to know. You might think, I, I can't really tell them about this thing. Please, don't be prideful. Don't be fearful. There is no shame in this place. Share it. it. It might be physical. It might be spiritual. It might be emotional. It does not matter. We want to know. We want to walk with you in the midst of it. And you as family, I know that God is building a, a community of faith that wants to do this with each other. Why? Because it's happening all over this place. And I'm so excited about what God is doing. So excited. So that's just a little snapshot of care ministry here at New Life and how we care. But it's predicated on this idea of sharing a burden and meeting a need. One of our core values, one of the keys, because it is the key to discipleship. It's relationship. It's when we get involved in life with one another. And around here, our, our, our focus is building relationships and making disciples. In order to make a disciple, you have to be involved with somebody. You have to be up close. You have to know each other. It is the fulfillment of the commandment of God. Jesus gave it to us. And then going back to Matthew 5, verse 16, he goes on to say, In this same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. In the same way that you're loving in your house, now take that to the world and, and love others. Share, share that love that you've now developed, that strength of love that you've developed within your family and take it to the world. And, and so next week, we're going to be displaying uh, one of the things that's a pretty regular thing for us, Angel Tree, where we get to love our community. It's going to be uh, filled with tags for, uh, for kids in the foster care system locally as well as our own family, the needs that will be here within our own family to, to demonstrate the good works so that they can do what? Give glory to our Father who's in heaven. Uh, this, see, this is how they recognize us. And back in John, he said that this is how they'll know that you are my disciples, is that you love one another. And then our love turns into loving them well. Why? Because we practice this, we strengthen this. Now again, as I said earlier, Chad, you're asking a whole lot of me. And you're right. And the reality is, is I don't have what it needs, what I need to, to do this. In fact, look back at Romans chapter 3 again. He says, I know your works. Behold, I have set, go back uh, to Romans, or excuse me, Revelation 3.8. I said Romans. I threw you off. Sorry, back there. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but a little power. 
and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I often identify with that little power. I feel like I'm just overwhelmed. I don't have what it takes, and you, not, you would be right in, in admitting that. Because we in ourselves do not have what it takes. You and I don't have the bandwidth and the capacity to love the way he's called us to. This is a supernatural kind of love. Which means we cannot do it in the power of our own strength. And if you are trying to do it simply in the power of your strength, you're going to get worn out, burnt out, used up, drained, and exhausted. And so how is it that they were able to not deny his name? How is it that they were committed for this? Because they operated in the power of the Holy Spirit. It's the only way by which we actually can love in this way. See, when we proclaim Christ as our Lord and Savior, he gives us the ability to fulfill all the commandments that he has commanded of us. Uh, loving like this is a fulfillment of his command, and it's only done in the power of the Holy Spirit. It, it, we cannot accomplish this any other way. And, and many of us have tried, and we've gotten burned, and we're like, done, I'm hanging it up. I, I'm tired, I'm worn out, and I'm, I'm, I'm frustrated because I've, just, I've been pouring out, and I can't anymore. But the reality is, is this is the same power that Jesus used to take a few fish and a few loaves of bread, very common things, and to do what with them? Feed thousands. This is the power that Jesus used to overcome death itself, the power of the Holy Spirit. And he's taken that power now and said, I give you that power and the authority, go love like me. Go do what I have set the example to do, and that that is often way more than we could ever do on our own. And so I know it's a big ask. I, I know it's an exhausting, spiritually taxing thing. But I also know that all of us have the capacity, because of the power of the Holy Spirit living inside of us, to accomplish this. And, and we don't have the opportunity to make excuses here. Students... Many of them are away this week, but students, and you, you have the ability to shape your households by how you behave, by how you love. When, when I see a teenager loving their brother or sister that's a teenager or, or younger, I'm like, that ain't happened naturally. And guess what? Parents take notice. I, I know of parents that are coming to this church because they're watching the transforming power of God's spirit in their teens. Elderly, many of you are saying, I've been there, done that, Chad. Don't ask me to do more. Retirement's a real thing. I like it. The reality is, is if you have breath in your lungs, God's not done with you yet. He has purpose. He has, uh, he has a reason for you. And, and you might not be able to physically do a lot, but guess what? Your notes of encouragement, your calls of encouragement, your prayers of encouragement mean more than you could ever imagine. I don't care what season of life you're in. God wants to use you to share the gospel message and the good news by loving each other well and loving the world around us well. Uh, we have no excuses, family. Why? Because Jesus commanded it. We can't get around it. And if we want to be commended like the church in Philadelphia, we have to do what he Commended them to do, hold fast to these things. Hold on tight and don't let them steal the crown that, that you've been given. You see, I, I wanted that promise that, that they had in Philadelphia, that promise of what? Permanence. He said, I will make you a pillar and I will put God's name on you. It's the promise that when we get to heaven, we'll receive that statement of, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into my rest. I don't want to get there and, and have some of the rebukes poured out on me that he has poured out on some of these other churches. And that means we have to be real about what it is that God is calling us to. It's not overcomplicated. It, it's not that difficult. And I know that many of us feel that we're not, we're not adequately gifted. Guess what? You're adequately gifted to love one another. You're adequately gifted to love others. 
All of us have been adequately gifted with the power of the Holy Spirit to accomplish this task. Otherwise, he would not have asked it of us. See, you and I as the church, the called out ones, we are the key to opening the door to the hearts of other people. We, we are the key by which God uses to initiate loving compassion for them to ask, what is different about you? What's going on in you that I'm not seeing in other people? And then the conversation starts. It's a beautiful thing. No excuses, family. So here's my challenge to you and to me in personal application. Am I going to be found faithful in lovingly sacrificing like Jesus? It, it will the world know that we are his disciples because of how we love each other and how we love them? We have an incredible opportunity. Jesus has said, I've opened the door for you. I'm the one that's standing here, and, and I've given you the keys and the power of the Holy Spirit to effectively make this happen. Now, the question is, are, are we going to do it? Or are we going to have excuses as to why we can't? Because we, we as people are really good at making our own excuses, justifying why it's somebody else's responsibility and not mine. And, and family, we don't have room for it. We're called to love and care for one another. And we're going to give every avenue to, to equip ourselves and to equip you and to do this well together. I, my men's group on Monday night, we've been studying through First Peter. And there's the scripture that talks there about be prepared to give a defense or an account of the hope that lives within you. I don't know if you know this, but... A lot of us use that, and if you go back and study it, that hope and that account, he's saying, be prepared in the midst of your suffering is actually what he's talking about. In, in the midst of being persecuted and, and people reviling you and saying all kinds of evil about you, respond with love and kindness. Respond in a respectful way. You see, when we do that, when we don't look like the rest of the world, when, when we live in love and compassion, the world is going to take notice and say, what about them is different? And then we have the opportunity to share the hope of Jesus. We, we, we crack the door open to their heart with love and compassion and caring. That, that's the entry point of the gospel message. It's the open door. A lot of us just like me, scared of the dark at times, we're not sure what's on the other side of that door. We're not sure what's there. But here's the promise. That door is open because Jesus has opened it. It's, it's available to us to walk through because the power of the Holy Spirit has equipped us to do so. And we can trust that the promise of God is true, that on the other side of that door is the Father. Just like me running down the hallway to my parents' room, the Father is on the other side of that doorway. And what do we have to fear in that? What do we have to be afraid of that we can't overcome together with one another in relationship with Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit resting in the Father's care? That's the good news of Jesus. That's the gospel message, and you and I are commanded to carry that out. If you're sitting here going, Chad, you sound like a fool. I know. I, I get it. It's, it's difficult. It's hard. And it only happens because Jesus allows it to happen in us first. And, and so if you don't know what that looks like this morning, I encourage you, let's have a conversation. If you're struggling to understand where you fit in this, let's talk. Uh, we, we want to know what your gifts are and we want to know what your burdens are. and We want to be able to help carry them together. Why? Because it is the gospel message of Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I don't always know what's going to come out. I don't always know what it is that you have in store for us. But I know that what you have in store is always good. I know that it's challenging and difficult and things become overwhelming at times, but we can trust you. We can trust you because you are good and you are kind and you are compassionate. You have called us to love, but not before you have 
first shown us what love is. You've not called us to a standard that you haven't yet set for us and demonstrated and committed to on behalf of us. And so thank you, Lord, for showing us what love looks like, for, for being love in front of us. And Father, thank you for the call to love like you, as difficult as it may be. Help us to love supernaturally, beyond our own capacity, in the power of the Holy Spirit. It's in your son's precious name we pray. Amen.